Hello, and welcome to another episode of Literature Podcast. I'm Joanna. And I'm Mish. And today we are welcoming back one of our favorite guests, Eileen Cook. Thank you for coming on to our show again. It's such a pleasure to have you you on. Thank you for calling me a favorite. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you are. You are. Um, So your newest book, You Owe Me a Murder, was just released on March 5th. Um, For our listeners today, could you give us a bit of a synopsis about it? I would love to. So this book was so much fun for me to write. I don't know if people like uh, Alfred Hitchcock at all, uh, but there's a movie called Strangers on a Train, which is what I loosely based the book on. Uh, Mm -hmm. So You Owe Me a Murder is about uh, two girls who meet on a flight. So we have Kim uh, and Nikki, and they meet, they're total strangers. They meet on this flight to London. Kim is on the way to the school trip. Nikki's on her way home. And uh, they share some secrets on that flight. So Nikki tells her about her mom, who is a lot of trouble uh, and an alcoholic and uh, not doing such a great job in the parenting department. And our main character, Kim, shares that she's on this horrible trip, uh, trapped with her now ex-boyfriend and his shiny new girlfriend. And Nikki jokes, oh, well, we have the excuse for a perfect murder. I should kill your ex-boyfriend and you should kill my mom. And Kim has a good laugh. And then something terrible happens to her ex-boyfriend. And Nikki shows back up and says, you owe me a murder. So Kim has to decide what she's going to do. She's either going to be blackmailed into looking like she killed her ex-boyfriend or she has to kill Nikki's mom. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) (laughs) This was such an amazing book. We both got advanced readers copies of it and oh, it was just so good i loved it yeah. so much like I just keep talking <laughs> <laughs> like i loved the past two y thrillers that i read from you um the hanging girl and with malice and this was exactly the same i couldn't put it down i'm like this is a one sit read and i'm not sleeping mm-hmm. tonight ever <laughs> it took me five hours to read it like i couldn't stop we, we had pizza that night because that's all i was willing to make <laughs> There was a lot of pizza while writing it because I would sit down and I would be like, oh, I know what happens. And then I had have to go back and change things up. So. And I just love your writing style. You have such a unique writing style compared to other authors that we've read. You know, you really hook us into the story at first with like a little bit of information. And then you like slip in little tidbits that like surprise you and just keep you like, oh, what? And, like, it's always so mind-boggling how you come up with these these plot twists. Like, it's just, oh, you're just a genius. Well, thank you. I don't know about that. But uh, (laughs) I do love uh, my editor when I was last in New York said, you're the most fun reading about murder. Um, And I was like, what a a great compliment. Uh, (laughs) And it's my goal, certainly, when I'm writing two things is one is um, I think my books read like how I sound. So I do try and. Um, include my humor and sort of have a little bit like they sound like me to me at least Uh, and the other thing that I'm really interested in doing because it's what I like is I like twists so for me when I'm reading a book because I read so many I'm sure it's the same with you guys Mm -hmm. after a while when you read a lot of books you kind of know often where the author's going so you're like I bet this is the secret boyfriend or let me guess this is the one who did it Uh, so my goal is always to take people down one path have them feel like, okay, I've got this figured out, and then rip the rug right from from under them and take them in a different direction, which if I did it right, which is always the great debate, people think like, oh, it was there all the time. It was available. So it should never feel like a cheat. That's my goal. Well, you definitely hit that goal with this book for sure. Like, oh, my goodness. So good. (laughs) Okay. So we have some questions for you, both pertaining to your newest book and you as well. So let's just jump on into this, shall we? All right. So can you share some stories about people you've met while researching this book? So I, people, I think, always want to know, like, if I actually murder people in my real life. <laughs> <laughs> they try to sneak up on that question, like, so do you think about killing people? Um, so the answer is, uh, no, I don't kill anyone. Uh, but I certainly did have a lot of fun. I did go to London to do some of the research for this book. So I traveled over there. Uh, And I actually did a semester abroad in London when I was in school. So for me, this was a chance to kind of revisit some old haunts and do that. 
Um, I did not meet anyone who was a sociopath for this book, um, but I used to work as a counselor and I actually did work with a couple of people that had that diagnosis. And I think what was interesting is how much you like them. Um, so people who are sociopathic can be incredibly charming and they're very good at pulling you in and making you feel like you're the most special snowflake in the room and it's really easy to get sucked in. And I remember as someone who was kind of early as a counselor at that point, my advisor warning me, like, you're being manipulated. Mm. Um, and even when I knew it, when I'm holding a folder that says this person's a sociopath, how easy it was to get kind of pulled in by that. Um, so for me, that made it a lot of fun to write that as a character. So I didn't meet anyone that thankfully met that criteria. Um, <laughs> And Alex, who is a little bit of the love interest, is probably just my dream book boyfriend. So <laughs> imaginary for now, but someday he'll find me. <laughs> so there are a bunch of places mentioned in this book. Um, the Churchill War Rooms Museum, the London Eye, the Wakefield Tower, Kensington Garden, Gardens, West uh, Minster Covenant Garden, the Victorian Albert Museum. Have you personally been to any of these locations? And if you have, which one was your favorite? Oh, favorites. Why do you do that? That's so hard. <laughs> um, one of the things that I absolutely love about London, and I think I stuck the line somewhere in the book, is when you're walking around London, it's this huge, busy city. It's obviously very modern, all this stuff going. And then you kind of come around a corner, and there's a building that's been there since the 1600s. And it's it does feel like magical. It feels almost like somebody from history could come around the corner or, you know, like if you saw Dumbledore, it wouldn't be like that <laughs> shocking. Like, in fact, there's a guy who wanders the tube in a full wizard outfit and the tube has, yes, I'm not even making this up. The tube <laughs> has these um, passes where you just like basically tap it and it opens the door for you. But people have taken the chip from the card out and put it into different things. And this guy put it into a wand. So he goes up to the thing and taps his wand and then the gate opens. And it's That's so fun. <laughs> it's so bizarre. And it, at the same time, it's like, it, that is exactly what I expect to see is somebody dressed in a wizard outfit in London. So just to walk around the city is probably my favorite thing because there are so many fascinating people and so many different people and so many diverse parts of town that you can do something like the Victorian Albert Museum, which is just gorgeous. It's just stuffed to the gills with all this great old stuff. And then you can walk out and you can be in this super modern part of time that looks like Times Square and then go around a corner. And there's the Churchill Museum, which is really weird because you go underground. It's actually the underground bunkers that they worked in during World War II. And they have all the sounds going. So it sounds like there's aircraft going overhead and the radio's playing actual broadcasts from the 1940s during the war. That sounds so cool. So it is gives you this kind of weird feeling like you're almost because it's all decorated back from mm -hmm. the 40s. So you're kind of walking through and then you'll hear the sirens go off and you'll hear this like whoop, whoop, like bombs are going off overhead. And it's just bizarre and awesome. And everybody should go. That's what I'm saying. And bring well, a copy of this book. <laughs> Something you'll read on yes. the It's added to the bucket list. There, there we go. So what was the hardest scene to write in this book? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. So I think probably the hardest scene to write, um, and I won't give too many details about it, is when uh, her ex-boyfriend dies. Um, because it was a fairly graphic scene and I unfortunately, uh, not in London, but in another city saw someone step in front of a subway car. Um, so it was something that for me brought up something that I hadn't thought about in a long time and was kind of like, okay, this is a chance to sort of write that out, but it is kind of one of those horrible things and how some people can actually be quite cold. Like a lot of people were just like, oh, now the trains are going to run late. And it was like, Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's my phone. Sorry. <laughs> I turned off my cell phone, but not my other phone. <laughs> right, so who was the hardest character to write about in this book? Uh, 
I think the character that was most fun was Nikki, just because she is so delightfully twisted. So she was very fun to write. Probably in some ways the hardest character to write was Kim. Uh, and that's the main character. And probably because she's a little bit like me. So she's a bit awkward, uh, as you can tell. And she is a bit trying to sort of figure out who she is and what's going on. I never got myself, I'm proud to say, into this kind of situation that <laughs> she's gotten herself into. But that idea of, and I, I kind of continually write main characters that are sorting that that out. Like, who do they want to be compared to who they think they should be or who they think others want them to be? And that was because that was my biggest struggle. Like, I certainly didn't figure it out in high school. Mm -hmm. I came to it probably in my 30s. Um, but was the idea of like, oh, this is who I am and I like me. And if you don't like me, that's actually your problem, not my problem. Um, and the amount of time and energy I spent in my life worrying about what other people whose names now I can't even remember thought of me, just like, what a waste. So, so I feel for Kim. I feel bad for her. So if you could go back in time and tell your younger self anything, give yourself advice or warn yourself about something, what would it be? Oh, without a doubt, the biggest advice I would give myself is lighten the heck up. <laughs> I was so anxious and stressed and worried about things. And the truth of the matter is, like, go for it. Dream big, hairy, audacious things. Like, I always was worried, like, oh, I don't want to, you know, go dream too big or do something too crazy or anything like that. And the truth of the matter is you get one shot, right? So go out and do all the things. And it was, for me, like that was the moment when I started writing was again, way later where I was like, I might not make it as a writer, right? The truth is you might never sell if that's what you want to do. But if you don't try, like for sure, it's not going to happen. And so for me, that was the realization, like, this is what I love. This is what I want to do. I got to do it. And so that's, I would tell myself, start way younger, like just do it. That's really good advice. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, I can't give myself bad advice. That would just be horrible to go back in time. And <laughs> all the be be like, like, and, yeah. Horrible advice. Here's some advice. <laughs> See that asymmetrical hairdo you have going on in the eighties that, yeah. Like for example, that was bad. <laughs> Someone should have told me don't do that haircut. <laughs> have you ever scrapped an entire draft of something or an idea? So I, I will break that into two parts. Yes, I have totally written a horrible book. Uh, I've written a couple that um, have never come out and probably never will come out, but I would never trash them. Um, I save them. Um, two reasons. One is I sometimes realize I've written myself in a corner and I don't have the skills at this point to figure it out. Um, but later I might, because I think one of the best things about writing is you actually just get better. The more you do it, the better you get. So I sort of save it for that reason. Two, sometimes I cannibalize it. So the story may be horrible, but I came up with a great character. So I will kind of just cut them out of that book and put them <laughs> into something else. Um, and I think, yeah, you just never know. It's a good reminder. And um, I'm proud of whatever I've written. There's some things that I wouldn't necessarily want to share with the rest of the world. Um, but I still love every character that I wrote. I still spent time on it and I still love them. So I can't kill them like all the way. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> All the way, all the way. They're never deleted. Let's put it that way. <laughs> all right. What would you say is your spirit animal? Oh, without a dog, a doubt, a dog. <laughs> and that's probably because I have to, and I'm totally dog crazy. So I am that person. Like, I talk to them constantly. Um, and I'm giving them the evil eye right now because, like, they are in strict orders not to bark while I'm on this interview. <laughs> and we have to actually manage to hold it together because they could hear your dog. <laughs> so they were like, I hear someone. Um, so they are, they are on point. But I think uh, dogs are amazing in that they are so loving and loyal and kind uh, and they're excited about everything. And that's me. Like I am, at least I hope I am, like if I am your friend, I am by your side no matter what. I am the person people call at 2 o'clock. And, um, you know, I don't lick your face or anything weird like that, but I will show up with ice cream and, uh, you can count on that. And I hope that I'm kind, like that is one of the things that I would like people to be able to say about me is that I'm actually a kind person who sometimes writes about people who aren't so kind. <laughs> That's where all my evil goes is on the page. <laughs> 
I like that. Dogs <clears throat> are amazing. Are. And cats are too, just so I don't get tweets. Like sometimes people will tweet me and be like, you talked about dogs. I, I like cats. <laughs> I do. It's just my dogs don't like cats. I'm <laughs> allergic, so. Yeah, there's that too. I don't want to puff up like a big blowfish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what do you hope readers take away from your book? Uh, Most important, which is I actually just hope people really have fun reading it. Like for me, reading is what I do for enjoyment. Like there are things I'm reading because I'm, you know, trying to study the craft a little bit or because everyone said it's an amazing book and you should totally read it. And it's going to, you know, change the way you see the world and that kind of thing. And I, I enjoy those books, but I also love a book that's just so much fun that you feel like you're just strapped in and it's a great ride and you're loving it. And most of all, I hope people really enjoy the book. Uh, and if they're taking anything from it, I hope what they're taking is uh, be careful who you become friends with. <laughs> um, because, and, and of course this is a way over the top example, but it actually is true that, uh, you know, who is in our life um, does make a big difference and sort of impacts who we are. So if you surround yourself with people who are, you know, positive and encouraging you to do things and, you know, want the best for you, then, you know, you reflect that. And if you're friends with someone who tears you down or is sarcastic all the time, like not in a bad way, because I love a little sarcasm, but sarcastic in a tearing down way or is constantly negative, it's really hard not to pick that up. So careful who you bring into your life. It does make a difference. That is very true. Okay. So the next question is, do you ever Google yourself? Honest answer or lie? <laughs> I think the lie is, of course not. Like, there's nothing to be gained from that. Like, true answer, of course I do. Doesn't everybody? And then, like, it's always, like, some photo that someone took at you at a conference where your mouth is open and you're looking really weird, like, ah. And you're like, I would take a picture in that moment. Um, but, yeah, I do have to Google myself. I don't care as much as I used to. I used to, like perseverate and be all like, Oh my God, like, so, especially if someone has a negative review or they didn't like something, it's so easy to get caught on that. Mm -hmm. And then I have the million and one books that other people love that I didn't. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if someone doesn't like my book, I'm disappointed, but I can survive. And I am the most popular person on the planet. Right. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> like, there's nothing talk. wrong with that. <laughs> nope. So do you listen to music while you write or do you prefer silence? I'm actually switching over. So I used to be a silence person and I switched and I actually went and now I'm starting to listen to a bit more music and some friends have made me some great playlists. And so I have done that. I always did sometimes have, um, what do you call them? Soundtracks because they, ha they're like designed for emotion. So if I was writing a chase scene, I would put on like, the Indiana Jones, dun 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 <laughs> so, you know, like, me all, like, all right, we're doing this thing now. Um, but now I often find I like just a little something in the background other than barking, which is my <laughs> usual soundtrack. <laughs> I noticed you mentioned Ruth Ware in your book. Do you enjoy her novels and do you have a favorite author? I love thriller writers, which is probably not too surprising. I love Ruth Ware, who's kind of doing modern day Agatha Christie stories, right? Like she's just doing such a fun spin on those. And I love them. I don't know if you've read Liz Nugent. Uh, she did Unraveling Oliver, um, Skin Deep. Oh, you have to read her. She's another British author who is spectacular. And I would listen to her because I like her audiobooks as well. And um, her books anytime. And my other favorite is actually another Vancouver author, Robin Harding. And she okay. did Her Pretty Face, um, which if anybody knows the Carla Homolka case, she did sort of a, so Carla Homolka um, was a serial killer along with her husband and she got out of jail early um, for basically ratting out her husband, who was the primary guy behind all of it. Uh, but she then was released is under a different name and as like volunteering in her kid's school. And yeah, that's the face everybody makes, which, is, <laughs> oh, um, which was a big scandal here in Canada. And uh, Robin took the, basically that premise. Otherwise it's not that story, but like, what would you do if you met someone um, at your kid's school and you became friends with them? And then you realized that they had this past, like, can anyone ever really be forgiven? That sounds like that's such an intriguing book. It yeah. is. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah. Her Pretty Face by Robin Harding. So check Her that out. Everybody's writing that down. Good. <laughs>
And one thing I will tell people because they changed it because publishing likes to keep you on your toes. So The Hanging Girl, uh, which is, of course, about the psychic, is coming out in paperback coming up in March as well. But they gave it a brand new cover and a brand new title. So oh. just so I always tell people because I, I would get confused. So it's now called <laughs> One Lie Too Many. Oh, wow. but it is the hanging girl. So if you've bought the hanging girl, by all means, feel free to buy this because it is a lovely, shiny new cover and you can have the full set. But don't <laughs> buy this and then be like, hey, I read this book before. <laughs> because I know that you did. Um, but they put a new cover on title on it. It's pretty. Hmm. That's a really I, pretty cover. I like it. Uh, and the reason is, I think, is I think the hanging girl, some people thought it was about suicide. And so people were creeped out and didn't want to read about it. Um, so that's why a shiny new, shiny new cover, shiny new title. I've never heard of that happening before, like a new title. Like a re, yeah. I do it every so often. So, and of course I laugh because I was like, well, make sure it says on there, the hanging girl. And they're like, okay. And it's like the world's tiniest font in the entire world. <laughs> Like it says it below my name. I can't even <laughs> see that. I see that there's font <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah. So, Maybe you know, a like line. If, if you have super eyes, you would see it. But otherwise, so that's why I'm telling everyone because I don't want I don't want those tweets. So don't tweet me and tell me like, hey, I bought this book. Just say but it's you're exactly welcome. the same. Yeah, you're we're totally welcome. It was a good book. Pass it on to a friend. Share the love. <laughs> and then you have the full set. So that's that. Even though you just had a new release, have you started planning your next book yet? I am plotting different things, of course. So I always like to sort of play with different ideas. And so I'm not entirely sure the shape it's going to take, but I am uh, very intrigued by both catfishing. So anyone who watches any at all daytime TV knows about people who sort of pretend to be someone else on the Internet. So that's fascinating to me. And also, um, I'm always interested in social media. So the idea of a party getting out of hand, so something that gets posted um, and then possibly gets out of hand. And that's about as much as I'll tell you so far. I am already intrigued. From this point in the interview, we will be continuing on to some potential book spoilers. So if you haven't read You Owe Me a Murder, you can go get a copy of your own at your local bookstore or at EileenCook.com. Read it, come back, and then you can finish this episode. This interview shall continue shortly. Welcome back. So we're going to get into a couple more spoilery questions now. And uh, we're going to start off with, did you always know how this book was going to end? No. <laughs> so I thought I knew how the book would end. And then as the book evolved, I started to change. Um, and uh, the biggest thing I wasn't sure about is whether or not Nikki existed. <laughs> that, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That makes sense. I, I was questioning if she existed. Right. So, yeah, there was a bit of a point where I was I was trying to play with whether or not Nikki was sort of the evil side of Kim, um, and then I decided that I liked that she really did exist. Uh, then I had to do a lot more thinking about who and why and what she was after. So again, for initial part, she was definitely seeking out her mother. Um, but then I decided I wanted a scene where Kim would confront the mother and it would be way more fun <laughs> if that wasn't really her mother. So that meant I had to come up with another twist, um, which was good. I like a little extra twist. And that, that was a really fun um, part of the book for me towards the end mm -hmm. when uh, Kim is like, what's going on? And like, even she doesn't know if she's going crazy or not. Like that was just such an intense twist to the story that I just loved. So I was curious. Did you think she was going to kill the woman in the bedroom? I thought so. <laughs> I I thought so. And then she, <laughs> she didn't. I thought I should be cheering that you think someone's going to die, but yay. They, 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 that was the goal. 
Well, it was the idea that, like, I think at this point, Nikki had already threatened to do something to her family and stuff. And I mean, at what point, if you think someone's horrible, are you going to say, okay, fuck it? It's, it's, I'll just go protect, kill the mom and get gotta, out of the way. Yeah, protect the people you care about. Well, particularly because the mom isn't portrayed to be a very nice character, right? Mm-hmm. So Yeah, we learn differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe best not to murder someone till you're sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make that a life lesson. <laughs> yeah, little life lesson. For sure, for sure. Make sure they're horrible before you continue. <laughs> and now there's barking on my end. <laughs> All right. So our next question is, if you had to describe Nikki in three words, what would those words be? Cold. Creepy. Charming. Look, they all start with the C. That was good. <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. But yeah, that's what I would do. Those seem like very accurate words to describe yeah. her, actually. Yeah, she's very, um, she is charming, and she was a lot of fun to write because she's got a good <laughs> sense of humor, and she's kind of entertaining and all of these things. Uh, but she's ice cold. Like, she can do whatever she needs to do. And, and that was fun to write as someone who does get all emotionally worked up about things like to write about a character who's just so able to do like, well, this is what I need to do. So that's what so I did. I did it. Yeah. So I did it. Um, so I find that. And then I think because she's like that, that makes her a little bit creepy. Yeah. Me. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you did mention earlier that you have a lot of the same personality as Kim. But if you were in Kim's exact position, what would you have personally done differently? <laughs> well, probably the one thing I do have different from Kim is I have the world's most amazing parents. <laughs> so I probably would have been like, Mom, Dad, I've gotten myself into quite a little pickle here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and would have wanted to, to basically reach out and get some help with that. Um, I tried to put Kim in a position where she doesn't necessarily feel that same ability to reach out as easy, which I think is hard. Um, I think it would be very difficult to know what to do. And I think I know myself, I've gotten myself in situations, especially as a teenager, where you do something that's not so great. Um, and then you don't want anyone to know that you did that thing. So you tell another lie to kind of cover up that lie. And then you're in a little bit deeper and then something else has happened And it is that thing of you feel like you kind of almost have to keep going because it's going to be too hard or too embarrassing to walk back. Um, But I would tell people in real life makes great fiction, but in real life, uh, walk back before you do something you can't undo. Please. (laughs) All right. So we the (laughs) next one's not a question. All right. Yeah, it's not a question. We don't even. Not a question. We don't even really know what we're how to say it. But page we see what you did there. We see what you did <laughs> on page 116. That the, Easter egg. The girl from Italy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that you got them both in, too. Yep. <laughs> I... So the girl from Italy a few years ago that they sent her to prison. Then that missing girl in Michigan was found dead. Everyone thought it was her boyfriend until a psychic figured out it was her dad. Loved it. Mm-hmm. Oh. So for me, that's just a lot of fun. And I probably will always continue to look for ways to put like a tiny Easter egg in just because one, I love to reward people because there's nothing better when you know you got a little inside joke that someone else is reading and isn't necessarily going to get. Um, so I, I love to sort of like just trickle a little thing in there. Um, and it's also just fun for me to see how I can sort of sneak it in. So um, if you like old Alfred Hitchcock movies, he appears in every single one of his movies. Um, so he's the director, but he will show up. So if you like them, it's fun to sort of watch and see if you can find out where he's going to sort of pop up in the thing. So that would be fun. <laughs> All right, so this is also isn't a question. Not a question. <laughs> okay, I'll still apparently have an answer, even. <laughs> <laughs> but I got super excited. It was page 148 when Nikki says, you owe me a murder. And all of a sudden, the title of the book got a million times more sinister than when I initially read it. <laughs> like... yeah, we both love when TV shows and books say the title in the book somewhere as like dialogue. (laughs) 
Well, I I actually have a funny story about that because the book was initially titled um, Strangers. Right. So we were having a talk about the title and um, my editor and, and so forth. We were talking about the fact that we, you know, obviously we really want people to pick up the book. And one, this is when we were talking about renaming the Hanging Girl, strangely enough, and that like we had to be sure that we had a book that would people would like suddenly know what it was about from the title. So we were like, oh, OK, it's not really working because you can't really tell what it's about. You know, we need something else. So and I can't of course, I can't remember now at this moment, but we were kind of throwing ideas around. And one of my author friends, um, Kelly Sharon, she wrote um pretty wicked uh, but so she loves serial killers mm-hmm. too when I had been writing the book she kept calling it you the you owe me a murder book because um, that's what I was talking about and so I mentioned it and then we all sort of stopped at the table and we went yeah <laughs> you owe me a murder um, and I knew the line was in there so and I just thought oh, that's a perfect title so it was strange because it was going to be named strangers and I love this title way better it's <laughs> super fun to say other people are always like Oh, that's a little scary. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I There's love the title. Confusion. It's a thriller. The title really hooks you. Like, yeah. it's it's intense, but it's it's in a good way. Well, and I think the goal is to make you be like, well, why would that be? Like, what's that yeah. about? And hopefully then you read it. And then there's that moment, which apparently is on page 148, where you suddenly will go like, ah, uh-huh. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> There is a purpose to them. Yeah. Those were all of the questions that we had for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners today? Uh, I would say thank you so much. If you have read the book and if you haven't, uh, I will thank you later. If you go out and read it, you'll earn my forever love. Uh, And thank you guys so much for having me and spreading book love, because that's the best thing you can do for an author is if you like a book, tell somebody else about it. So thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. We're pleased to have you and we love your books so we <laughs> love helping yeah. you promote them yeah well, we're, we're honored you're on here <laughs> there you go deal <laughs> well if you'd like to get more lit be sure to subscribe to us on podbean itunes spotify Castbox, or any other place that you find us all of our other social media will be linked down below and if you enjoyed this episode be sure to like it or give us a review it really helps us to keep doing what we love until next time bye bye, bye. Thank you.